Okay. So good evening, everyone. We are gathered here in Second Life in the Deer Park. And now I've been asked I've been asked about this by various people over the years. When I showed Second Life to my Thai supporters in Los Angeles, they they I think were somewhat amused at the concept of going into a, a digital world like this. Recently someone asked, doesn't this go against your principles of trying to understand reality? How can you, on the one hand, claim to be interested in understanding reality and on the other hand, engage in self-deception, the self-deception of this virtual reality? Uh, the answer is quite simple. It, I mean, I, I talked about this a couple of days ago, a few days ago. There's no difference between virtual reality and and so-called ordinary reality. So, anyway, tonight we are attempting to do a video record of of the Deer Park which just allows me to upload the talk to YouTube as well anyway neither here nor there but, uh, but yeah, so this is being recorded for YouTube we're live here in Second Life and there's also a live should be a live audio stream if everything's working as planned the live audio stream will also be recorded and placed on the website so tonight I thought I would talk about the good I had a chat with my mother, a text chat with my mother this evening. She wants to get me a winter hat for Christmas. Well, I actually, she asked me what I wanted for Christmas because I'll be going to visit her in Florida. So she was texting me links to winter hats on Amazon. And I asked her how things are in America these days. And she... She responded, um, you know, with, with mixed feelings and... So we started talking about letting the world, letting the the world's problems get to you or letting the issues and conflicts get to you and how it's easy to let them overwhelm you and we got to talking about the presidential candidates and how uh, she had had to uh, unfriend people because they were talking bad about her candidate and so there's all there's been a lot of as everyone knows there's been a lot of this in the past year and a half of vicious what we call partisanship but really just means 
hate mongering and, and fear mongering and demonizing no? terribly unwholesome stuff we're always fighting against something right it seems too often we're in society we're anti this and anti that and protesting this and protesting that and I told her you know I, I, I may not like someone but I uh, I may not uh, agree with someone but I would never express hateful opinions of them or hateful thoughts towards them that's what I said to my mother but I was thinking about it and I think the problem is our, our focus on the negative and I think, I told my mother, I said, you're such a positive person, because she really is. And sometimes I kind of, in my mind anyway, criticize her for it, because I think, ah, you know, it's it's somewat naive or, or self-deceiving -decept to always look on the bright side of life, right? But there are aspects of positivity that I think are really important doesn't mean not acknowledging the bad. I mean, sometimes it does, and that's my fear, is that it can be ignoring the problems, right? Trying to find ways to... So my mother hasn't gone on the news and hasn't... She doesn't... Yeah, anyway. But... Uh, but positivity also, also can refer to, or, or an aspect of it, is not getting mired down, caught up in the problems. It's quite interesting as a Buddhist, especially as a Buddhist monk, to know where to draw the line. And uh, I think that's the line, is knowing the problems but not getting caught up in them. You want to help people. The interesting thing about helping people is you never really help in a really ulti in an ultimate sense, or in a, in a real, in a, in a lasting way, if you by getting involved in the problems, the help you give practically is is of practical value and sometimes important, but it's not actually the the, the spiritual or the psychological or the the help in an ultimate sense. You only get that by staying out of their problems and. By, by working in the realm of absolutes, the realm of absolute reality, what's really going on. Don't get mired down in things like politics, society. I was talking this morning to a meditator about uh, generosity and whether it's good karma or bad karma to give to, say, a drug addict. And that's really a good question. I mean, it's a question that of, often comes up. But goodness isn't there. Goodness isn't in the the actual act. It's in the mind. Goodness is in ultimate reality. Karma is, is based on your state of mind, your, the quality of your mind when you give, when you do any sort of goodness. And so it comes not from actually, the goodness comes not from actually providing food to a homeless person. It comes from the qualities of mind that lead you to give to a homeless person. And so it, it, it has very much to do with natural wisdom, not any intellectual idea of what this person might do with your gift, but a natural wisdom of what's appropriate at that moment, which often takes into account the, the, the situation, but it's very natural. There's a natural sense of the person, the, re the recipient's goodness, and there's not no worry or concern for really knowing their goodness, but there's a natural sense, and you may do the wrong thing, you may give to someone and they go out and buy drugs with it, but that's really not the point. The point is your sense of clarity of mind and purpose and intention, you know, the desire to help someone, often simply the desire to fulfill someone's request, 
someone asks you for money, you refill, fulfill their request. And the request. In order to maintain harmony, maintain rightness, you know, you give too little, and the person is gets upset. You give too much, and the person feels entitled. Right? If you give a lot to someone who doesn't deserve it, also loses the sense of harmony and the sense, the natural wisdom. It's, there's a if you, when when you're mindful, you can sense to some extent, or or you you're in tune with your sensations with your instincts, whatever they may be. And so you take them, uh, you have clarity of mind, and that clarity of mind provides you with a sense of what is good. And so you focus on the good. You don't actually have to concern yourself with the particulars of the person's condition beyond Assessing their their sincerity and and getting a sense of how they strike you, how they play into this uh, phenomenological uh, analysis or or estimation of the situation of giving. It's somewhat of an interesting question. I don't want to talk too much about that, though it's an interesting aspect. Today what I wanted to go over is goodness. Talk about goodness as a practice. And emphasize this as, I think, a proper way of understanding the Buddhist teachings. Not to dismiss the problems, but to try and, and solve the problems through goodness. Right? Goodness, problem solving is, is, is one way of describing goodness. It's only good if there's a reason for it and there's a benefit to it and a problem or a challenge or a situation being ameliorated or addressed. And so that's a sort of positivity that I think we could get around in Buddhism. For example, as I was saying about talking bad about people, even public figures hating them, you know, denouncing them. Remember the Buddha's words, he said, if a person's if a person's speech is no good but their actions are good, or if their speech and actions are no if their actions are no good but their speech is good, or if their actions and speech are no good but their thoughts are good. He said you should think of them like a, a cloth. If you find this th cast off cloth on the side of the road and part of it's rotten, you should tear off the rotten part, throw it away and focus on and, and carry the and keep the good part. Don't throw the whole robe away. Or you should uh, think of them like a pool of water clear, nice pool of water with a layer of scum on top. But if you're really thirsty, well, what you do is you put your hands in the water and you part, you use it to part the scum and get at the clean water underneath. Of course, in India these days, I wouldn't recommend it. Most places in the world, I wouldn't recommend it. Where I grew up, you could do that. And I guess back in the Buddha's time you could as well. Where I grew up, you could just go into the forest and get water. But the point being, you you dismiss to some extent. Maybe not dismiss, but you put aside the bad aspects of the person. Because you're trying to solve a problem. It doesn't solve a problem. It's interesting to see what, what goes on in America in regards to these elections especially and what goes on in the world in regards to religious conflict between Christians and Muslims and Jews and even Buddhists and Hindus. And, you know, how we deal with our problems. How the Buddhists in Sri Lanka dealt with the Tamil problem. Tamil problem dealt with the Tamils. Yeah. 
because you can you can you can of course react in many different ways there are many different things you can do but the old buddhist joke comes to mind not joke but the twist is don't just do something sit there because anyone can do something you want to try and fix things this is what happens we say do something and then you try to give advice or you try to solve the problem and the real question is what works and what what does it mean to work does it work when you make your opponent angry does it work when you shame them does it work when you vilify them not what makes you feel good not what gains you allies and a sense of righteousness you know a lot of protest is terribly righteous self-righteous makes you feel good about yourself I'm on the right side well who cares if you're on the right side of the war it's still a war if you're going to war it's a failure I would say of both sides it's a failure of everyone so I thought about this confrontation in, in on the bus and I was somewhat concerned about my behavior because I was like, did I, should I really have gotten involved there? Probably. If I'd gotten involved like I had in America, I could have been sued for misconduct. Because these two guys were yelling at each other on the bus. And there was a wheelchair in the middle of the situation. And I picked the wheelchair up and moved it just to try to solve the problem. But I look at that and I kind of say, you know, it's got to be kind of like that you got these two sides fighting and they're stressed and, and there are practical issues that are, in, that are uh, increasing the stress. And sometimes it's really the focus on the practical issues, solving the problems. So rather than taking sides, I decided I would be helpful. You know, do a good deed, pick up this guy's wheelchair. and Not that I took his side, he was more belligerent than the other guy. <laughs> But uh, to solve the problem, you know, to do something good. And sometimes that takes, because it was basically an ignoring of the conflict. I'm not, I'm not that comfortable talking about myself in this way, but I think it was a, a good choice. And I think that's an, maybe not the best choice or exactly right, but that kind of thing. I, I couldn't figure out what to do to help these two people. How do you stop them from yelling at each other? And I think you don't. I think in many cases, uh, this is the key, is, is, is sidestepping the conflict and you know, bettering everyone's situation. Because so often, you know, if, if, if they had all focused on the task at hand, we could have all gotten to class on time. The guy in the wheelchair had an exam, which he ended up missing. I think other people on the bus, the same thing, had exams that they were going to be late for. If we worked more on problem solving than conflict, and winning wars, winning conflicts, right? Wars, I think, don't start because of genuine problems. They start because of prob the creation of problem and the focus on not the problem, but the conflict. Conflict escalation in many ways. We escalate conflict. So it was really interesting to see how, just for example, this bus thing occurred. Guy in a wheelchair has a problem, needs to get on the bus. Driver tries to do the good thing. So far no conflict, but the man starts to you know, talk too much, I guess, and complain a little bit, or push the bus driver a little bit a guy in the back of the bus escalates the conflict and okay here we have a problem then the guy in the wheelchair totally blows it out of proportion and escalates it to the point of no return and then the bus driver steps in again and starts to make threats at the man in the wheelchair that he's going to call the supervisor and of course the man in the wheelchair buckles down it was a 
comedy of errors in many ways. It was one thing wrong, done wrong after another. But it's a this is a, an example, you know. It exemplifies the problem of escalation, conflict escalation. Really a good study in, for peace studies. Good study in conflict escalation. So, let's focus on goodness. What I really wanted to do is list out ten sorts of goodness, but I'm not going to go into much detail because I don't want to take too much of your time. I think the that general framework, the idea of focusing on goodness, um, is most important. Maybe I won't even go through the ten. Let's just talk about let's talk about applying it to meditation. See, we're all sitting here, cross-legged. intent upon the practice of meditation and betterment of ourselves. I think you can you can apply the same sort of framework, not focusing on trying to attack the problems, right? I mean, in the most obvious sense, not trying to get rid of the problems. When you have pain, not opposing the pain. Even when you have bad emotions, not opposing them. Even when you have you know, evil inside, that you know, oh, I have such evil inside. Not opposing that, but trying to figure out what actually works. Because it feels kind of good sometimes to hate yourself and berate yourself and feel guilty. Is kinda, it's kind of indulgent to feel guilty. Oh, I'm such a terrible person. We all do it. But it doesn't actually solve the problem. That's the key. I mean, it might make you feel better about yourself to hate yourself, <laughs> ironically. Yes, yes, I know I'm a bad person, but I hate myself too. We do this. But uh, it doesn't actually solve the problem, and that's key. Because so much of how we react to things inside and in our meditation is, is simply habit, because it makes us feel good rather than actually assessing whether it solves the problem. How we deal with pain by avoiding it, by finding ways to uh, to fix it. How we deal with uncomfortable meditation sessions or uncomfortable aspects of meditation by finding tricks or ways to avoid or circumvent them. Well, meditation is really much simpler than that and much more challenging as a result because it requires you to be honest, it requires you to requires you to be quite perfect, natural, Meditation is like the growth of a tree. It doesn't come because you nail the trunk together and tie the branches on and glue the leaves to the branches. It evolves naturally. It evolves from, a, again, this natural wisdom. Rather than trying to fix or, or construct something, it evolves out of cultivating a pure natural state of mind. I think natural is a very good way of understanding it because it feels natural. It feels more natural than our natural state. Our natural state being our ordinary state of clinging to things, reacting to things. I think, that, I think that's interesting and something that's missed because meditation can feel quite artificial in the beginning and we have a sense of trying to create an artificial state. We may not label it as such, but the states we think of are actually artificial. Well, jhana, uh, trances are... Well, maybe that's a bad example, but they are still somewhat artificial. But there are many artificial states of avoiding our problems. Med a mindfulness is an artificial, um, an artifice, or the practice is anyway, a true mind, actual mindfulness, when your mind is clear and you 
as a result of the artificial practice you you become present you're suddenly here you're suddenly a, a matrix of experience you're suddenly seeing and hearing and smelling and tasting and feeling and thinking and nothing else you're the you are the experiences That natural state is what grows, it's what grows purity, what grows goodness. And so our job is to cultivate, to protect this tree that's growing, to not let it fall over, which would mean falling into defilement. Because that's the thing, I mean, the tree is natural. But if you leave the tree alone, it won't grow. It will fall over, it will break, it will be eaten by animals, whatever analogy you want, to, whatever imagery you want to use, it won't grow. For most of us, it won't grow straight, it won't grow natural, it might very well die. Which is why we cultivate meditation. We have a very strict set of practices that are quite, quite artificial, quite methodical, systematic. But that's all just in protection of the tree. That's not the actual tree. Our practice of this mantra meditation is like any mantra meditation. It's an artifice. It's artificial. This is like the sticks that you use to prop up the tree. It's like the rope you use to tie the cow the ox, the baby ox, when you're trying to train it. So I wanted tonight's talk to be about this idea of focusing on the good. It doesn't mean ignoring the problems, but it means focusing on solutions, focusing on Focusing on what's good about you as well in the meditation, focusing on strengthening your goodness. Don't worry too much about the bad. Don't obsess over it. Why that why that there is that imbalance, right? Why shouldn't you just focus on everything equal? It's because encouragement. When you focus on what's good about you, it is part of the path because we're trying to decrease, diminish, we're trying to free ourselves from the evil. So by not giving them as much power or obsession, there actually is a benefit to this imbalance. at least in so far as our outlook goes right because we were all, we will often step back from actually being mindful and say is this working or how? we will we will remark upon how we feel and sometimes get quite discouraged when we see oh i have such evil inside i have such chaos inside i'm never going to be able to do this And uh, I think there's an argument to be made for focusing on and and uh, working on the good aspects. You have such goodness inside. If you compliment someone, they feel good. I read this on Facebook recently. It was something about calling someone beautiful, but it's, it goes for compliments. If you compliment someone, they'll feel good for ten minutes. If you criticize someone, they'll remember it forever. They'll feel bad all day. It can be very hard on ourselves. And you get encouragement from compliments. My teacher was big on compliments, complimenting people. It was remarkable, really, how good he was at 
at seeing the good in people. Good he is, so it's not dead yet, I don't think. Uh, but just watching him, I think this is an important thing to remember. That's another form of goodness, compliment, you know, appreciating other people. But appreciating ourselves is important too. Appreciating goodness, focusing on the good in people, not focusing on the evil. There's a, so there's some interesting these ideas of, of working with people you don't like and, and expressing the, in, the opinion that if they do good things you'll work with them. That's a very valid point, you know. I'll be with you. The Buddha said similar things. I'll, I will be with. I will agree with anyone. Doesn't matter who, if they say something true, if they say something right. So you don't consider the source not so much. You consider the nature of the of the act, the nature of the speech, the nature of the thought. And you agree with what's right, and you disagree with what's wrong. You don't make villains out of people or heroes out of other people. You focus on goodness, focus on the good, and you remember that. I think a very poignant image is that of the Bodhi tree or the flower, the lotus flower. The Bodhi tree is an interesting one, though, because a Bodhi tree will grow anywhere, and most Bodhi trees, they grow out of bird shit bird poop. In Thailand the Bodhi trees grow everywhere but Bodhi trees are fig trees so the birds eat the figs and spread their droppings around and so as a result you'll see Bodhi trees growing out of the top of another tree. So there are certain trees that up in the crook of, of the middle of the tree there's a huge Bodhi tree growing on top of it. What I mean to say is a Bodhi tree grows anywhere and it grows out of feces. Most plants do, they grow out of manure. The beautiful, most beautiful flower uh, requires manure to grow. I mean it's just, a, it's just imagery but it works to think about think about how unstained one can be in the midst of filth. The Buddha used this kind of imagery often about being unstained or unsullied even in the midst of great filth like water off the back of a lotus water off a lo lotus or a mustard seed on the tip of a needle I think he used that analogy to mean that it doesn't stick mustard seed does not stay on the needle you can't something like that If you is that I firmly believe, and this is a firmly a Buddhist concept, that even in the midst of great chaos, great trouble, great evil, even whether it's inner evil or external evil, great and wonderful things can still be done. Heaven can be found, peace can be found, nibbana can be found. There, are, there was this movie we watched many, many years ago called I think Life is Beautiful. It was an Italian film, actually. About how this guy in the anyway, in Nazi Germany manages to make everything. I mean, it wasn't completely a Buddhist film, but it's a very, very positivist film. No, po not positive, but uh, positive thinking type of film. But to some extent he did it for his son, tried to make his son, make sure his son was not traumatized by the horrors of the concentration camps. And so I'm not obviously uh, completely on this idea of the power of positive thinking. It can be quite dangerous, delusional or deluding. But there is some extent to which we have to, should, and benefit from focusing our attentions on the positive and on the cultivation of positive and learning to 
let go of the negative. And I think letting go of the negative also involves not taking it as seriously. Uh, an increased focus on the positive. I think there is an argument to be made for not taking everything equally and it's, it's putting more focus, at least intellectually, at least in terms of our goals, to focus on the positive. Focus on and so the Buddha often did talk about goodness. Rather than focusing on the problem, what's wrong with the world? And I guess that's the point, is you don't focus either on what's right in the world. You focus on what can be done to make the world a better place. And so the same goes with oneself. You don't focus on what's wrong with you. But you don't focus on what's right either. You focus on goodness, on, on doing good, on the cultivation of good mind states. There, okay, so that's that's the focus of tonight's talk. That's a little bit of dumb, I think. And I think we actually managed to record on three different mediums tonight. Oops, I'm still recording, which means that's showing up. All right. No more playing around. Are there any questions? I'm on limited, I have limited screen space here, so I can't actually pull up the questions that are online, but if anyone here has any questions, otherwise, yeah, you're welcome. Thank you all for coming out. And this will be up on YouTube, hopefully tonight. Alright, then I'll say if you do have questions, bring them back another day and type them out and have them ready to answer, because ready to ask, because I don't know sitting here whether anyone is trying to uh, try, trying to uh, type it out, frantically type out a question. So don't get frantic, type it out in advance and just copy and paste it in if you can. All right, well, I'm glad it was helpful, good food for thought for tonight. I wish you all a good night, and see you again in the near future.